uh, very, very often people would criticize people a lot and they would criticize themselves also. So it's very common for people to live under the law. You know, naturally, people, you know, are raised up under the law in a sense that, uh, that they always require other people to do certain things and criticize people when they cannot do certain things. And also they are being criticized by people. So a lot of people have a lot of um, uh, guilt feeling and also living under pressure. A lot of people are living under pressure. So that's very common, very common for people to live under pressure. Uh, and then now there is another extreme that there is grace, but without the law, then people would just say, uh, we just live under the grace. We don't have to do anything. That is also a problem, serious problem. Now, uh, the biblical teaching is that we are motivated by God's grace to obey the law, and then we will be, uh, you know, that we are free to obey Him. We are motivated to obey Him, and we enjoy obeying Him. Now, the law doesn't mean the Old Testament law. It, it means, you know, uh, God's commandments to us that we should obey, now, mainly the New Testament law, and also part of uh, also the Old Testament moral law that we will follow. Okay. Um, first, we understand the definition. What is God's law and God's grace? God's law tells us what to do. Uh, and then God's grace tells us what God has done to bless us. Now, this is very important. It's what God has done to bless us. Very often when people say, okay, love God, and they think this is grace. But God, we love God, that is what we do. So that's still the law. It's, or another word for the law is commandment. God's commandment. Okay, so that's commandment. And then uh, God's grace is what God has done for us. It's God loves us. God blesses us. God gives us redemption. God works in our heart to give us uh, a strong spiritual life, help us to grow in Him. And God has a wonderful plan in our life. So it's all God doing something for us to bless us. Okay? And then two, God's law tells us what uh, God's judgment and punishment. Now, God's law is not just judgment and punishment. It tells us what to do. For instance, love God. That is telling us what to do. But when we don't do it, when we don't do it, then there is judgment and punishment. If we don't uh, love God at all, cursed is him that who, who doesn't love God, doesn't love Jesus, uh, love the Lord. And that's 1 Corinthians 16, 22. And God's grace tells us God's forgiveness and help, that he forgives us and he helps us. He gives us strength. He changes our life. Uh, and then three, God's law motivates us by punishment. So people, you know, that uh, we are supposed to obey God's law. If we don't obey them, there, is, there are serious conse consequences. There could be discipline and punishment. And God's grace motivates us by grace and love because He loves us. Now you notice that in the New Testament, there are a lot of promises. Now these promises are uh, God's grace, the promises of of blessings. For instance, uh, uh, at the beginning of Jesus' teaching is a, a beatitude. You know, the blessed is he who mourns, for they will be comforted. So it's all uh, promises. Promises. Uh, so it um, motivates us by telling us, you know, if we, uh, God has prepared for those who love him, things eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and uh, human mind cannot think of. So it's something that God has prepared for us to motivate us. Uh, blessed is he who hears God's word and obey it. So it's blessed that God has promised us even when we give a cup of cold water to a little one, we will by no means lose our reward. So that is um, God's promise of grace uh, that motivates us by grace and love. You know, now, not every commandment is immediately followed by the promise. But if you look through the whole, uh, the whole Bible, the New Testament and Old Testament, you see that there are promises 
both in the Old Testament and New Testament, when people obey God, then God will bless them. And then God's law should not be the main motivation. It should be the, uh, the you know, a secondary motivation. And God's grace should be the main motivation. And I will say this for myself, and I hope that is for, true for you too. My main motivation, I would say 99%, uh, my motivation to trust in God, to love God, to obey God, and to serve God, 99% is God's grace. I know that when I love Him, my whole life, He'll, you know, he'll bless my whole life and I'll have abundant life, I'll have joy and, and strength, I will have uh, uh, w God's wonderful plan, I will have uh, spiritual gifts and uh, opportunities to serve God and everything. So God will give us everything we need uh, when we love God and also to to make the best of our life to um, that we can enter God's perfect plan. So that is uh, motivation by God's grace. Now for me, there is a secondary uh, motivation, but that's not the main motivation. I realize that when I sin or when I have sinful thoughts, it could bring destruction. As Jesus said to the man healed of 38 years of sickness, He said, you know, do not sin anymore lest the worst thing will happen to you. So if you continue to sin, the worst thing will happen to you. Now, any time when we sin, even, even a sinful thought, if we let that stay in our heart, it would you know, affect our life. It would take away our joy, take away our strength. It will uh, cause us to have, you know, it, uh, it will damage our relationship with God and with people and also, God is not pleased with us. So any sin, even though when we repent, God will forgive us. But still, there are consequences of sin. For instance, we, we get angry with somebody. You know, and then we repent and then ask the person to forgive us. Now, uh, God forgives us, forgives us, but there is still a consequence. And if we continue to get angry with people, there will be more serious consequences. It will affect our relationship with people and it will affect our ministry and affect our joy and our, rela uh, and our, our, our ministry in God. So there is a warning that when we sin, there are serious consequences. Now sometimes the consequence might not be proportional to uh, the, the, uh, the, the sin we commit. For instance, if a person, if I use an analogy, okay, he, most of his life he is obeying God, loving God, but he has hatred for some uh, a person or he has some negative thinking in his mind. Now, even though it's not a very serious sin, but yet it could affect him. It, the uh, degree of effect, how it affects him is not just one uh, percent. If one percent of his life has sin, it's not just one percent. It is uh, much more than that. If you know, if for instance he is angry with somebody, that uh, you know it could affect over uh, maybe sixty percent of his life because he's then he will have anger and it will affect his life, affect his ministry, affect his uh, take away the joy. So all this the influence is much larger than what the sin we have committed. And that's why I really pay attention not to sin, not to let any sin stay in my mind. Now, we all have sinful thoughts. The point is, we stop the sinful thought as soon as we notice that, the, that we have a sinful thought. That is the key to victory. Okay, so, so I hope you all understand that, that, that God's law is what God tells us to do. Oh, God's commandment and God's grace is what God has done for us. And we should motivate people by God's grace mainly. But we should also tell them if they sin, there are, con uh, there are consequences that uh, it could bring uh, damage to his life, that they should understand that. But the main motivation should be that 
Oh, God loves me so much, therefore I want to obey Him, I want to love Him. Okay, now if a person is motivated by law mainly, that he says, oh, I have to, I have to repent, I have to obey God, I have to follow God, I have to pray. You know, a lot of times when people teach uh, other Christians to grow in God, they always tell them, do this, do that, do that. Okay, keep praying, read the Bible more, and pray more, and obey Him, and tell people about Jesus. Now, this is all true. But if he's only motivated by the law, what happens is, then it's under pressure. Oh, I have to do it. If not, there will be serious consequences. And then two, the person will be filled with guilt. Oh, I cannot do it perfectly. You know, because we can never be perfect. And then there is a sense of failure because he says, well, I cannot, I just cannot do everything that, that God has commanded me. And then they like to compare. They say, oh, I have done better. Or that person has done better. And then they want to compete. They want to be better than other people. And then they could be critical of themselves and of other people. So if a person is motivated by the law, many. Now there are many Christians who are made of, motivated by the law and even there are many preachers who motivate by the law that they will keep telling people you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to obey, you have to uh, tell people about Jesus. It's always telling you have to do it. And what happened is then is then the people, you know, they, they're just under pressure. They're just under pressure. Uh, and it's not going to, you know, then his life would have, you know, he would feel pressure, he would, you know, he, he would feel guilty. Okay, motivated by grace. There's no pressure. Okay, Jesus said, you know, even when we give a cup of cold water to a little one, we'll by no means lose our reward. So I know that when I even do the, the smallest thing for the, uh, 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 an important person, I will by no means lose the reward and God will be happy with me. So anything I do for God, God will be happy. Now, at the same time, of course, we realize that sin is destructive. Therefore, we don't sin. It doesn't mean that, okay, we just give one cup of cold water and then we're satisfied. We don't stop there. But we'll say, okay, whenever I have any sin, I will take care of that. And, uh, and then when I do anything for God, when I trust in God, when I love God, when I obey God, when I serve God, when I bless other people, God is happy with me and I can be very happy. Now, I have been a Christian since uh, 1970. I've heard many sermons, but I have not heard anyone preach about, even when we give a cup of cold water to a little one, God is very happy and He'll reward us. Therefore, we can always encourage ourselves and say, oh, I've done this for God and God is happy. Now, that is not pride. It is just trusting in God's promise. He says that He's happy because He, he will reward me. That means He's happy. So I can be trusting in God and I say, okay, God is happy with me. God is loving me. God is obeying me. Therefore, I can be very happy that I follow God. Now, make sure that we are not uh, saying that because of pride. We're not proud. We're just saying, I God has promised that, God has promised that He will reward me, therefore I can be very happy. That way, there's no pressure. And for me, I continue to serve God all the time. Actually, for now, my ministry is all for free. I don't, you know, I don't take any salary now. I just keep blessing people. I do all kinds of ministry. I go into the mission field. I do broadcasts and I help people and I study the scripture to find the truth and then t uh, train more people, teach more people, and I do it all for free. And I, you know, I'm freely motivated and I enjoy that. So there's no pressure. Now, at the same time, I will take care of my sin, but that's not under pressure. I just know that sin is destructive. And overcoming my sin and repenting of my sins and overcoming my sin will bring benefit to my life. Therefore, I gladly. Uh, repent and turn away from my sin and I do it uh, happily, joyfully. So that's no pressure because I know that God is happy with everything I do for Him. Now it's very important if I use this comparison. Now for people 
it's very it, it's often like that. I use an illustration of a of a child who goes to school, and then he fails. Very often, the parents would yell at him and punish him, and say, "You are not doing well." So the child work harder, and the child pass, passed the next time. Now, what would the parents say? Sometimes the parents say, "Well, well done." Sometimes, but very often they will say, "Well, don't think that you are doing very well. You just passed. It is not great. You just passed. You need to work harder." And then the child keep, keep you know,、uh, improving, and he got ninety percent. The parents might say, "Wow, ninety percent, and you just..." Need ten more percent, you have one hundred percent. Why don't you have one hundred percent? Is, you know, is、uh, we often see that people just look at how people have failed instead of looking at how they have improved. So that is, you know,、uh, using the law to motivate people, and that gives people pressure. A lot of people just motivate people by saying, "You have to work harder. You have to work harder. You have, you know, you still." Are not doing well, and I have heard many Christians say, "Oh, I I failed God in many ways. I failed in many ways." So they feel very guilty. And I ask them, "Okay, have you tried to trust in God and obey and obey and repent of your sin and serve God?" They they said they they have, but they have failed in certain ways. So I said, "Look at what Jesus said." When you give a cup of cold water to a little one, you by no means lose your reward. Now, the person who gives a cup of cold water, he might not have, you know, done everything perfectly well, but he has done this good thing for God, and then God will remember and reward him. Now, of course, we want to repent of our sins. It doesn't mean we give a cup of cold water and then we can just continue sin. No, sin is destructive. But when he says that, oh, I'm improving in God, I'm following God, then he can be happy. Then he can be joyful and motivated to serve God more. So I hope we are motivated like that. Then there is no pressure. Whenever we do anything for God, God is very, very happy. God is pleased with us when we obey Him and follow Him. God is very happy, and God will bless me. So there is no pressure. Uh, that there is a reminder that he should not sin, but it's not. Oh, I have to obey God. This is not under that kind of pressure. And that's why the Bible says, "Rejoice in the Lord." When we serve God, and Jesus said, "You know, your my yoke is easy, my burden is light." Why is it easy and light? Because God gives us strength, and God is happy with anything we do for Him. And whenever whatever we have done, not we have not done well, then we repent, and God is very happy. Okay. Secondly, filled with forgiveness and acceptance, he knows that God God forgives him and accepts him, and there is a sense of accomplishment that I have I have I've done this for God. Thank you. Now, but we should not be proud, because our righteousness are like filthy rags. They're not perfect. We're not perfect, but. When we done whatever we can do to serve God, and then we can ask God to forgive us if if we have sinned during the when we when we obey God. Now, when we obey God, we still sin.、Uh, let me explain that. Like for instance, when we help someone to believe in Jesus, we do evangelism. When a person doesn't believe, sometimes we have a little unhappy feeling inside, or we are under pressure, or we are. You know, we、uh, don't trust God's work, or when we pray, we don't trust God、uh, that He is、uh, listening to my prayer,、uh, He is、uh, responding to my prayer and my needs. So very often, when we pray, we don't have faith. That is also a sin. But when we say, "Lord, please forgive me, forgive my sin," even when we obey You and serve You, and God is very happy to forgive us, and God will. Uh, reward us, so there is a sense of accomplishment. Yes, I have done this for God, but we are not proud because、uh, our good works are never perfect. So we can never be proud of our good works. 
But we have done this for God, and I know that God is happy. So we have a sense of accomplishment. I'm improving. I'm growing in God. Thank you. And then they will be more willing to praise other people. That they'll say, well, you're growing. Because in God's kingdom, we are not in competition. We are helping each other to grow. When a person grows, we will say, wow, you're doing well. You're doing well. You, you are following God. Then we praise other people. And then we want to help. We want to help others because we want to help them to grow. Uh, because in God's kingdom, it's not like in the examination. When we go to school and do examination, and then uh, uh, very often people want to be the number one. And then if they help other people, then the other people can become the number one. So they don't want other people to do better. They, want just, uh, they just want to be the number one. But in God's kingdom, it's not like that. The more we help people, the better we are, the more happy God is with us. So we want to help people and bless people. In God's kingdom, it's not a competition, but it's building up each other. We help each other, and God is happy with me, and then I can be happy with myself, and I can enjoy my ministry. And then we can also see the goodness of self and others. We can see our goodness that I'm growing, but I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect, okay? But I am, uh, but I'm growing in God. I am, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I am obeying God. I'm loving God, and also I'm helping other people. So that is seeing the goodness of ourselves and of other people. Okay, filled with appreciation of God's nature, then. We'll say, well, God's nature and His grace is so wonderful. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through this you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So here it says that, um, that we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through this, through these promises of God, that we may be partakers of the divine nature, that we can partake of His divine nature, that it, we can take part is, in His divine nature, that we can have His joy and love and compassion and uh, uh, self-sacrifice and kindness and goodness. So we can take part in His divine nature. And uh, so we grow in God, that we grow more in His divine nature, that we, uh, that we have His joy and strength and, and promises and compassion on people. Okay? Now, we don't become uh, like God. Okay? We can never be the Creator. We have His nature more and more, His loving nature, His kindness, His goodness. So we have uh, God's love and care and acceptance. You know, that God's nature is beautiful. So we want to understand God's nature more and think of His good nature. That God's love, He is full of love, who is full of care. He has uh, acceptance of people. He accepts people. And he is holy, and he is just, and he appreciates people. He appreciates us, and he lifts us, lift us, uh, lifts up people. And he has wisdom and power and a wonderful plan. And God works in all things for our good. So he has all this good nature. His nature is his inequality, and his grace is what he does for us to bless us. His nature is His inequality, and we appreciate God's wonderful nature. Now, here in this verse, we see that um, Jesus, uh, His kindness, His goodness, His grace. So we can always think about God is kind to us. He is happy with us. Matthew 9.22, But Jesus turned around, and when He saw her, the woman who touched Him, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. 
and the woman was made well from that hour. Now this woman has broken the law because she was unclean and she secretly touched Jesus. But in the process, she would have touched many people on the way. And then Jesus said, who touched me? And then she dare not say it. And then the disciples said, well, why do you say who touched you? Everyone is pressing against you. But Jesus said, that must be someone who touched me because there is power coming out from me. And then the woman admitted that he, it was her who touched Jesus. And then Jesus said, well, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people would say, well, Jesus re re would rebuke the woman, but Jesus did not. Jesus said, be of, be of good cheer. Don't worry. Relax. Be happy. Daughter. And he called her daughter. That you are be beloved by me. You are, you are my beloved daughter. Your faith has, has made you well. Your faith is not by doing w much work, but you just trust in me. You just trust in me. Faith is trusting in God. Your faith has made you well. And so when we come to God, we know that God is happy with us. And God will bless us and God will say, your good daughter, your good son, relax, rejoice, don't worry. So that is grace. Jesus is speaking with grace that don't worry. And Jesus is saying to every one of us here, don't worry, relax, be happy. Because I'm happy with you when you have faith in me. When you trust in me, I'm happy with you. Your faith has made you well. When you have faith in me, uh, that, you know, that heals you because I'm, I'm, uh, I want to bless you. And you are my son, my daughter. So that's Jesus' words. It's full of grace and mercy and kindness. And God is with us all the time and is blessing us. Psalm 139 verse 5. You are all around me. This you is God. God is all around me. In front and in back. And you lay your hand upon me. So that is the grace of God. He is with us all the time. He's blessing us. So we see in the Bible there are a lot of promises. A lot of promises that can motivate us. Now some people say, oh God, you're far away from me. Actually, the Bible says, you know, even when one sinner repents, there is joy, much joy in heaven. So, if we have failed, we have sinned, we just re repent and then there is much joy in heaven. The whole heaven rejoices over us. And when we trust in God, God is always respond to us. When we pray to Him, He'll always hear our prayer. When we love Him, that He'll prepare for us things eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and the human mind cannot think of. So there is always, there are always promises that God has promised us. That when we trust in God, when we love God, He'll promise, He will, uh, He will give us all these uh, blessings and grace to help us. And here it says that, God, you're all around me. You're in front of me and in back of me. You're surrounding me and you lay your hand upon me to bless me. You're with me all the time. You're with me all the time. So we have kind of confidence. God, you're with me all the time. That would motivate us to love God. When we live under God's grace like that, then we'll say, wow, that is wonderful. That's wonderful. You know, God's grace is abundant. God's grace, first He created the world, He created us, and He sent Jesus to die for us, and He sent the Holy Spirit to move in our heart to guide us to believe in Jesus. He, he gave us the Bible, and He, he sent Christians to evangelize to us, and He uh, built up the church so that we can be nurtured in the church, and He uh, he moves in our heart to help us to grow and He gives us joy and strength whenever we come to Him. And then when we trust in God, then we have more strength and more joy. And so He blesses us all the time when we obey Him. He blesses us all the time when we obey Him. So I hope that, you know, that we all see that, well, God is helping me from the beginning to the end, all the way through, that from the beginning, before I was born, He already has a wonderful plan to bless me. 
And in the process, the more I trust in Him, the more I obey Him, the more I'll enter God's plan. It's already planned. And He'll give me provision so that I can follow His plan. He'll give me strength. He'll give me wisdom. He'll give me everything I need so that I can follow God. So I hope that we'll all see that, wow, God has prepared all these things necessary so that I can grow in Him, I can be uh, uh, blessed, I can be strengthened, I can serve God, and He'll give us opportunities, He'll provide for us, so we have everything we need, and we have nothing to worry about. So that is, um, it's wonderful. Our whole life is full of promises from God. And then whenever we obey Him, He'll promise to reward us, and uh, He'll help us to enter His wonderful plan. He'll bless us this life, in this life and in, in, the, in heaven. And also He prepares heaven for us. All this, all this provision and His spiritual gifts He gives to us, all this are grace of God. So I hope that we, we all see the grace of God. And also, even when we have failed Him so many times, even when we sin, He still continues to bless us. He, when we repent, He'll forgive us and He'll give us strength and He'll He'll renew our lives. So God, you're so wonderful. You're so wonderful. We appreciate you. We thank you. We, we love you. We, hallelujah. We praise you. So we live under God's grace. It's very, very important. Uh, so I hope that you all live under God's grace. Now many, many Christians and even pastors live under God's law. The word is always full of pressure. It's always telling people what to do and criticism. And then, Christians will feel tired and they will lack motivation. But if they know that everything they do for God, God is happy, then they will be more motivated and also more joyful. You know, all day long, I'm, I, you know, I love God and praise God. At the same time, I believe that when I love God and praise God, God is very happy. God is rejoicing over me with, with singing. That's Zephaniah 3.17. He's rejoicing over me with singing. He is very, very happy. Therefore, I can be happy all day long because I know that when I love God sincerely, God is very happy with me. 